seated. As announced, our theme today is really the complicated relationship between our motives and what we actually do in our outward lives. We take our text from our leading thought from Psalm 37, where we read, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. With the emphasis we find throughout the writings for the new church on self-examination, it's not surprising that this question often comes up. Can we know our own spiritual states? Jeremiah answered the question this way, saying, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But then added prophetically, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Still, we know that the Lord judges all our works according to their interior quality. And with that in mind, there are teachings in our doctrine that suggest we need to know our spiritual states so that we can stay on the right track. And yet there are teachings that seem to say also that we can't know, at least we can't know for sure. So our question today is this. How concerned should we really be about this question of our motives? Of course, New Church teachings are clear that we should be thinking about our motives, not always, but now and then. But when we find on what, what if we find on reflection that something we have been doing or that we want to do is tainted with an element of pride and, and self-love, then what? Can we therefore say that we shouldn't do it or even think about doing it? What if we did it in the first place because we knew we should, because it was the right thing to do, and then began to feel some unhealthy pride and self-satisfaction about it? Or again, what if we find on careful examination that we really were thinking mostly of ourselves all along, our reputations, our hope of reward, or even just that very self-satisfaction? Does that make us hypocrites in the Lord's eyes? In this connection, the Apostle Paul's famous saying that we are justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law was not based only on the idea that the Lord did everything for us, meaning there is nothing left for us to do but have faith in him. When you read the whole context of that teaching in Romans chapter 3, uh, you can see that an important part of the message is that we are still obliged to do what is right. It's just that we must not try to take credit for it, lest we start to boast about it as if, it were, as, as if we ourselves were good, whereas the truth, and our doctrine confirms this, is that any good we do comes exclusively from the Lord. We are simply instruments in His hands when we do what he teaches. In any case, how can we change the way we feel about ourselves? It is the Lord himself and he alone who can change our loves, giving us what we call a new will in the understanding. To think otherwise would be to imagine that we could do our own open heart surgery. It's not possible. The Lord has to do it for us. So, so what is the answer to this motives question? Can we know if we're on the road to heaven or not? And how much attention should we give to this question anyway? When the Lord called his first disciples, he did not tell them to go into some deep reverie about their motives. Rather, he said two things. Repent and follow me. That is, in New Church terms, 
shun evil, and do good. These two messages were reinforced over and over again throughout his ministry, even as they are reinforced in our heavenly doctrines. And yes, of course, he taught a great deal about the importance of our loves and motives. But in the end, he always focused on simply doing the right thing. Love your enemies, he said. Do good to those who hate you. Give to him who asks of you. Love your neighbor as yourself. And when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't overthink it. Just do it. How can we help it if something of selfishness creeps into our actions? The important thing is that we recognize it, acknowledge it, and try to get past it. In that vein, the risk of hypocrisy is often misunderstood. People think of it as doing one thing while actually intending something else, or, as in this case, doing something good while there are selfish motives in the backs of our minds. But in fact, everyone has two minds, including what we call the old will and the new will, or the external and the internal. As long as we live in this world, we are all going to be like that field of wheat the Lord described in Matthew, having tares growing in it. And as he said, we have to let them grow together until the time of harvest, lest in the effort to uproot the tares, we destroy the wheat also. This is not said by the Lord to excuse or justify evils of any kind. It is simply making the point that regeneration takes a lifetime, and we need to be patient, both with ourselves and with others. Real hypocrisy involves deceit, that is, the deliberate effort to make people believe you are good when you are really bad, or that what you are doing is good when what you are really doing is actually bad. But if you have mixed motives, you are, to be clear, simply human. You can love yourself, as our third lesson, or second lesson rather, clearly pointed out, and you can still love the Lord, and from the heart perform acts of kindness to the neighbor, and from conscience behave justly and fairly. Like Jacob's speckled and spotted livestock, it will all be sorted out in the end, specifically to the end, that like Jacob, we should become exceedingly prosperous. Now, as you probably know, despite the writing's use of the term the regenerate to indicate one who is on the right path, our spiritual development is never an accomplished fact. We always have the potential to improve. Even the highest angels have the potential to improve. No one is ever absolutely perfect except the Lord. And yet, we sometimes use the term as if it were a state of perfection that we should be able to attain, a state of wholesome goodness, unaffected by any sort of selfish or worldly considerations. No, friends, regeneration is a process, not a goal except in the sense that a joyful, peaceful, heavenly life dominated by love to the Lord and the neighbor is the goal. So we have the teaching frequently referenced in the writings about our dominant or ruling loves. In the New Jerusalem's Heavenly Doctrine 56, we find a person's life is really the same as his love. And what his love is like determines what his life is like, in fact, his whole personality. But what makes a person is his dominant or ruling love. That love has a number of subordinate loves with it which derive from it. These appear to be different, but are each a part of the dominant love and make up a single kingdom with it. The dominant love is, as it were, their king and chief. It controls them, and by their instrumentality, using them as 
immediate ends aims at and pursues its final end, which is the mainspring and ultimate of all, and thus both directly and indirectly. What belongs to the dominant love is loved above all things. Okay, fine, you might say, but then how can we determine our dominant or ruling loves? Again, we read from the New Jerusalem, Everyone's pleasure, bliss, and happiness comes from that person's dominant love and is characterized by it. One calls pleasant what one loves, for that is what one feels. One may, however, call pleasant what one thinks about and does not love, but it is not the pleasure of one's life. It is what pleases his love, which is anyone's good, and what displeases it, which is his evil. But then again, what's the point of knowing all this? It's not as if we can compel ourselves to have better loves. In the work on divine providence we read, the external cannot compel the internal, but the internal can compel the external. Who can be compelled to believe and to love? One can no more be compelled to believe than to think that a thing is so when he thinks that it is not so. And one can no more be compelled to love than to will what he does not will. For belief belongs to the thought and love to the will. However, we read, the internal can fight with the external and by combat force it to compliance. This combat takes place when a person thinks that evils are sins and so resolves to desist from them. For when he desists, a door is opened. And when it is opened, the lusts of evil which occupied the internal of his thought are cast out by the Lord. And affections of good are implanted in their place. Here, in a nutshell, we see the challenge of our whole lives. We are all a mixed breed, speckled and spotted, brown and black, streaked and imperfect in other ways. We are like wheat and tares, like the fruitful, rocky, thorny, and hard soil where the seeds of truth may or may not take root. But the one thing we can control is what we choose to say and do. So to build on our last analogy, we can cultivate the soil of our minds by simply doing what the Lord expressly teaches us to do. Why? Because he said so. Because we know it's the right thing to do. Because we know we should, even when we don't really feel like it. As the prophet Jeremiah said, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. Why? Because as we noted at the beginning, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways according to the fruit of his doings. Which, of course, brings us right back to our leading passage this morning from Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord. Don't be thinking about yourself too much. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Clearly, this does not mean that he will give us whatever we want, but that he will give us what to want. Or in other words, he will give us the new loves that can only come from him and that do come from him little by little over time as we devote ourselves to keeping his word. Remember the Lord's instructions to Moses after he had given him the Ten Commandments. 
Speaking about the conquest of the land of Canaan in the spiritual sense, he was referring to our own combats of temptation against the loves of self and the world. And he plainly said, I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. Why does it have to be this way? Why can't the Lord just make it happen quickly? The answer, of course, is it's complicated. In expounding these verses, the Lord points out that because we are born into evils of every kind, and because our whole identity is so completely tied up with these, this life cannot be destroyed suddenly, for if it were destroyed suddenly, the person too would perish. Nor can the life of heaven be implanted suddenly, for if this were implanted suddenly, the person would again perish. Little by little, however, we can adjust to the necessary changes and retain a sense of our identity, even rejoicing in the growth that we experience along the way. Why? Because we feel a part of it. We feel as if we were doing it ourselves, only with the Lord's help, even though the reality is exactly the opposite. He is doing it. He is doing it all with a little help from us as we cooperate and simply do the right thing. Amen.